when you get past what they look like, Mike and Kirk are very similar. This is Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it's time for the Atlanta Football Party, only on Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Atlanta Football Party, your home for the best Atlanta Falcons football talk. It's local insight. You can't get anywhere but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste, alongside me are Jarvis Davis, Aaron Freeman, and Tori McElhaney. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Now that the playoffs are a wrap, Sports has kind of stopped sporting like we want them to, but this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone all day, all summer long. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Our Atlanta football party is also part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today, our show is headed to the boot and we'll tell you one thing the Falcons do better than that team that plays in the boot, but we look three weeks and even three months down the road to kick off the show. So Jarvis, we are now less than three weeks away from the start of training camp, but almost three months removed from the Falcons adding to the QB room ahead of this season. And while QB1 and QB2 may seem decidedly different, I saw a Sports Illustrated article that found some intriguing similarities between Kirk Cousins and Michael Penix Jr. So for you, how do those similarities maybe give a little more insight into what Raheem Morris and Terry Fontenot value in a quarterback? They trying to they value their jobs, right? Because if Kirk Cousins stays healthy and Michael Penny Jr. ends up being the guy that I feel like he should, he could be in the NFL, these guys going to be around for a long time because we know how important the quarterback position is because and I, I, I go back to the um, Raheem's opening presser, right, when he was introduced as the head coach of this team. I remember him talking about being an elite processor. Processor, that's what they're looking for. And when you talk, think about Kirk Cousins, right at his peak, when he's healthy, the dude gets the ball out of his hands. He knows exactly where he's going. He, he has a great rapport with all of his main targets, right? Justin Jefferson has been become one of the best wide receivers in the league with him throwing him the football, right? Because that matters. We understand how much quarterbacks matter as far as how good wide receivers can be. <clears throat> Drake London, <laughs> Kyle Pitts, you know, all of those guys understand that. So I feel like when you have a guy like Kirk being able to get rid of the football and, and, and having that elite accuracy specifically on that deep ball, I can basically say, hey, take Kirk's name out and do and do the same for Michael Penix. So when I feel like Raheem Morris kind of, when you look back, you look kind of say, oh, man, he was basically telling us who he was going after, you know, right then and there. So, yeah, I, I, it's not surprising at all when you try to, when you just put these, take how they look out of the equation, right? You know, black guy from Tampa, Florida, white guy from the Midwest, you know, you just dig into that tape. You say, okay, I get it. I totally understand it. Yeah, you have those differences. You have mid-30s to mid-20s, a lefty versus a righty. Aaron, a lot of people have pointed out all of the differences, but I thought this was an interesting SI article that pointed out the similarities of who the Falcons are looking to now and in the future for their leader under center. So what do you think about those similarities and what they tell us about what Ra and, and Terry value? Yeah, I think I think there are a lot of similarities between those two. I, I think in terms of when you look at what Michael Penix has the potential to be, I think a lot of it is kind of a Kirk Cousins plus, right? Because of the arm strength, maybe because a little bit more athleticism that he'll be able to do a little bit more than what Kirk Cousins has been. And as Jarvis talked about, you know, when Kirk Cousins has been at his best, it's been because he's been a great sort of ball distributor and getting the ball into the hands of his playmakers, whether that's Justin Jefferson or TJ Hawkinson, Jordan Addison, Stefan Diggs, Adam Thielen, all those guys in Minnesota going back to his days in Washington as well when I think like Deshaun Jackson and those guys were, were there and what not and so i think that's kind of the vision for what michael Penix will be here in atlanta and you know with drake london and kyle pitts and Bijan and whoever else they add over the next you know couple of years as we sort of wait for michael Penix to sort of get the the keys tossed to him uh so he can sort of uh take out the car uh and and, and go joyriding in his offense but yeah I, I think there's a lot of similarities between these two guys in terms of how they win from the pocket, being those sort of ball distributors. We saw Washington's offense, you know, with their weapons, and that's really kind of the strength of what Michael Penix 
uh, can do, which is get the ball into his hands of the playmakers. Yeah, Tori, and I heard elite processor. I heard mindset. So I'm hearing a thread here, even in similarities with what Jarvis is seeing and, and what Aaron is seeing as far as what brings these quarterbacks to a place where they might be more alike than they might be different. What What do you see and what do you think the value was from the front office and, and from the sidelines and seeing those similarities with these two? Yeah, I think that, I mean, accuracy goes a long way. Um, and and Something that always stood out to me, especially the last two years with Michael Penix in Washington, is I felt like he made his receivers look really good. And I, I felt like he was positioning the ball, he was getting the ball out. And I I just felt like all of those receivers that, that Washington had, this is nothing against them at all, because I think they're phenomenal players. And you hope that they will be that in the professional league as well. But I just always felt like when Michael Penix was in the pocket, they were going to be a threat, not just because one without the other, because like with these receiver quarterback relationships, like you can't have one without the other. Like we've seen it with, with Drake London and Kyle Pitts over the last like couple of years. When you don't have someone who can get the ball in their hands, it makes it really difficult for these receivers to shine. And I always felt like Michael Penix put his receivers in the best position to shine. And, and I've, often felt that way when when Kirk Cousins is on when when he's really kind of firing on all cylinders and and that Minnesota offense particularly when they were at their best like that's what he does too so I, I think it kind of goes a little bit to not just accuracy but being able to play to the strengths of your receivers and also kind of using the whole of the field and and, and looking at kind of where you're putting your skill players in the best position to make the plays that you pay them essentially the money to make. Yeah. Justin Jefferson would probably agree with you, Tori, with a $140 million deal, 110 mil guaranteed earlier this year that he inked with the Minnesota Vikings, courtesy of a lot of the work that he did with Kirk Cousins and Roma Dunes. They would probably agree the same with the number nine pick in this year's draft. So yeah, you definitely see those things. And also those guys, meaning Penix Jr. And Cousins are two players who at points in their career, of course, Kirk right now, but Penix, of course, along the way in his collegiate career, had to face similar adversities with how do you come back from an injury and be your same self, if not better. So definitely, I think that Raheem Morris, once again, we look at how my Raheem Morris approaches things, how Terry Fontenot approaches things, you see their mindset. And I just thought, again, that that article was very interesting and in pointing out, hey, these guys might be a little bit more alike than the differences that we point out that will make them good, if not great, for this Falcons organization. And then, Tori, as well, you kind of look at it and you say, I know for me, not that I needed another modicum of confidence for what Coach Ra and for what Terry Fontenot have done and will be able to do, but I also feel like this is a reminder or another kind of feather in their cap giving confidence about what that seamless transition will look like whenever it occurs from Penix to Cousins. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole point of all of this, right? Like, they didn't want to make the same mistake that I feel like was made when they let Matt Ryan go off to Indianapolis, when you didn't have a secession plan in place and you kind of were in this, what I've been calling quarterback purgatory for a couple of years. And you, you didn't. And you're being nice to her. Right. Nice. <laughs> I do work for the team. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> I but, understand. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you look back at kind of the history of it and this isn't like 10, 20 years. This is very, very recent history. This is the same front office that they're like, you know what? We can't have this quarterback position, the most posi important position in, in arguably all of sports be this fabricated, like up in the air. Maybe we'll do this. Maybe we won't like mm -hmm. not having a true plan. This is the plan. And they have, I mean, I go back to, I guess it was Kyle Smith or Terry or somebody who said after the draft, they were like, look, like, we feel like we're set for the next five years at the quarterback position. And in this day and age, in this league, the way the quarterback position is, like, that's that's an anomaly. Um, so I, I do think that that was always in the back of their mind. They had to share up the quarterback position because they couldn't couldn't do what they did the last couple of years. Yeah. And free, I was sharing just yesterday, really the entire weekend on my radio show that that's the, the dilemma that the Cowboys are facing. Like they don't want to pay Dak Prescott, 
but you want to be in a situation where you go back to, in their case, purgatory, if not QB hell as well, because there was a gap, whether you think Tony Romo was great or not. It's the gap between Tony Romo and Dak Prescott that should be alarming for Dallas. And yeah, I agree with Tori. I think that that what the, the Falcons experience personally, but when you look across the way and you see what other teams are dealing with and not wanting to pay a quarterback, regardless of if you think they're worth it or not, what the market might be dictating, this was the right move on the part of uh, the Falcons to know that, hey, we've got it shored up for at least, like you said, four or five years. Yeah, you know, definitely finding a, a franchise quarterback is the, the hardest thing to, to find for your football team. And obviously the Falcons feel like they've gotten two, so that they have a surplus uh, in, you know, in the short term. And I think when it, when it comes to the sort of the long-term outlook, you, you feel a lot better about the potential transition point from Kirk Cousins to Michael Penix, uh, especially if the Kirk Cousins era goes as well as I think people hope, right? Like it just, it's one of those things where you, you get buy-in automatically. It's like, oh, here's their plan. It was a little bit unorthodox of a plan. It caught everybody by surprise a little bit at, at draft time, but you can buy into their vision moving forward if they can sit here and, and you know, get the results on the field from Kirk Cousins. And it's like, oh, okay, like they they know what they're doing. But if they don't get those results on the field, then that breeds a little bit more doubt into the long-term vision of the football team. But I think for the short term, you know, I think everybody's expecting this team uh, to, to be successful this year. We're hoping this team to be successful this year because uh, it's been a long time. Uh, and so I think that gives you a lot more buy-in for the future if they can achieve that uh, success this upcoming season. Yeah, and just to, I guess, to put a bow on this thing, this is, it's very important for them, for all of this to work, right? And I think it starts with, with Kirk Cousins um, because of coming off this big injury, really his first injury of his of his career, professional career, you know, being, at, being out for, for a certain amount of time. You're talking about Achilles, like it's just so many things that come with that, right? Because we always talk about how when guys go through uh, tearing their ACL and outside of Adrian Peterson coming back and having the most amazing year you can come back off of after te- after doing that, there is a, like a, a, a like a little period that you go to that you have to kind of get back in the groove of things, right? Because there's so many things that go with, you know, having those knee injuries like that, like from a mental standpoint and like there are so many things that that you have to just like deal with you know going through that to get back to feeling like yourself as a as a player so for me i feel like you know it starts with kirk and if kirk i feel like if kirk does what he's supposed to do i feel like michael pennis will fall right into place because i i really like there's something about him that i really really like and i think that he has the tools to kind of be exactly what the falcons think he can be All right, guys, time to have a little bit of fun. We're headed to NOLA in the deep dive. This episode of our Atlanta football party is brought to you by FanDuel. Now, I love sports, of course. I'm talking about it right now. I love sports so much, I never wanted to stop. And thank goodness it never does. But when the playoffs wind down, whether it's the NBA Finals or the Stanley Cup final, it feels like sports is kind of slowing down to a halt. We, of course, have fewer games. And the sports kind of aren't sporting like we want them to. So FanDuel actually lets me and you, the Braves, who made it to the All-Star game in Major League Baseball, this is something that could be really fun to do and something that can put a little more change in your pockets. Head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most of your summer. That's FanDuel.com to start making the most of your summer. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Woo, I see another face in the space for this morning that I'm so excited is joining us because in the next few weeks leading up to Falcons training camp, our sports party is going to take you guys all around the NFC South. So, of course, why would we not start in NOLA? Of course, we got to start in New Orleans, and we're starting with our guy from Locked On Saints, our host, Ross Jackson. So, Ross, first and foremost, taking it back to last season, the Saints actually Mm -hmm. ended 2023 on a high note winning for their last five games, finishing the season with nine and eight. But 
What do you feel they did in free agency and even in the draft to improve where this team is to maybe make a run at a return to the postseason? Uh, not a lot. Uh, I don't think that this team improved very much in terms of its roster. Uh, I think it improved big time on its coaching staff. I think that's really the big thing that they're looking uh, to carry them ahead here in 2024. But in terms of free agency, they added Chase Young. We'll see if that actually benefits them. He had a neck procedure. We'll see how quickly he's able to get out on the field, though it does look like he's expected to be out there later on this month come training camp. So he could help to bolster their pass rush a bit. They added Willie Gay as a third linebacker maybe second linebacker. We'll see what happens there to add a little bit of speed to the defense. But outside of that, most of their additions are rookies, and those are going to be more wait-and-see guys. Uh, they move Trevor Penning from left tackle to right tackle. I'm sure that'll help. And then we'll see exactly where everything goes from there. So I, I don't know that they really did a ton to their roster to make themselves better. They did a good job maintaining their talent. And so I think what they're really banking on is that coaching staff change and co all those coaching staff changes on the offensive side of the football. And in the the growth of their young players going into another year of experience to help bring them forward a bit here in 2024. Ross, you talk, uh, Tanisha brought up, you know, a good point about them winning for their last five. I know there was some mm -hmm. certain expectations, you know, when, when the Saints signed uh, Derek Carr. Now, mm -hmm. like going into year two, are those expectations still the same or how is the Derek Carr experience experience being in New Orleans like how do they feel after year one where Derek Carr is and kind of what he what does his future look like for the Saints going forward yeah I think if you ask 10 different fans that question Jarvis you're going to get 10 different answers uh everybody <laughs> is sort of all over the place when it comes to Derek Carr so the way that I'll kind of say this is I think expectations are low on the fan side expectations are high on the organization side so your typical middle of the road quarterback experience is what the New Orleans Saints are kind of going through here. Uh, Very you know, familiar Derek with Carr, that, by the way. Yeah, right. I mean, look, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, yeah, he got a, a $37.5 million per year contract, which is right in the middle of the NFL in terms of starting quarterbacks. And he produces like he's in the middle of the NFL for starting quarterbacks. And so what the hope is now is that the new system brought in by Clint Kubiak which is going to be a little bit more predicated on the outside run game, more two wide receiver sets, more bigger bodies on the field, all these other pieces that I think that they, the, the organization expects him to take a step forward. Uh, he produced in or near the top 10 in some of the more basic passing metrics. And then in others, he produced towards the bottom half of the NFL. And so it, it, it's the pretty typical experience of the standard NFL quarterback right now and so depending upon who you're asking you're going to get different answers about what the expectations are but certainly most of the expectations should be that he'll improve with a better system than what Pete Carmichael had in New Orleans last offseason now Ross I'm, I'm curious because to me I thought the Achilles heel of last year's Saints team and why I wasn't necessarily buying into their NFC South uh, title hopes was their offensive line and I thought mm -hmm. that was probably the worst offensive line we've probably seen in New Orleans in like 10 or 15 years. Uh, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the changes that they've made up front? And do you expect that offensive line to grow and improve this upcoming season? Yeah, I think you could expect it to grow and improve. Uh, the, the issue is that what you're really relying on is young players to make that happen. You're not relying on newly acquired veterans. You're relying on a brand new new to the NFL rookie left tackle. Uh, you're relying on a second year left guard who hasn't played, but you know, maybe a few snaps dealing with shoulder injuries and things like that during his rookie season at Nick Saldaveri. And then you're hoping that the move from left tackle to right tackle for Trevor Penning pans out with a new offensive line coach uh, incorporated in all three of those things as well. So I think it makes sense to uh, kind of expect some improvement here, but whether or not they'll get it kind of all remains to be seen. It's really tough when you're relying on the young younger guys to push the development. But what I will say is that they're all hyper athletic and that's what you need in this wide zone offense. You need those guys that can move off the snap, move off the football, get into those gaps, get up to the second level, third level and make those blocks downfield. So if the saints are able to get their offensive line moving in that way and staying out of as many third and long situations, they should be in a better place. It's interesting. Uh, Derek Carr was far from the most sacked. In fact, he was one of the least sacked quarterbacks last year, at least in the bottom half of the NFL. 
well. But in watching the games, it, it felt like those sacks just all came at the absolute worst possible times, late in games, late in drives, uh, when the game was on the line, when you needed something to happen, all that. And then, of course, the run game wasn't there. So I think those are the two places where you're really looking for this offensive line to improve is the run game, which the scheme might help out with. And then ideally getting out of those third and long situations where Derek Carr was sacked on third down more than any other down last year. I'm curious. When, this is obviously the time where we're talking about roster construction as well. Going mm -hmm. into training camp, we have 53 men roster cut downs, all that kind of stuff. But for you, as, as y'all are kind of going into training camp, what are the main position battles that that you're really locked in on? Yeah, um, I would probably say slot corner is going to be one to watch. Alante Taylor could be going into his second year as a slot corner, but the Saints uh, spent the second round pick actually traded up to draft Alabama cornerback Kool-Aid McKinstry, who's 6'1", 208, 200 plus pounds, a really physical press man corner that fits the style, much like Alante Taylor does. So uh, looking to see if there's going to be a little bit of a battle there, I think is going to be big. The safety position next to starting uh, safety, Tyron Matthew, could be a little bit of a battle. Veteran uh, safety, Jonathan Abram going up against second year uh, safety in Jordan Howden. They also brought in veteran uh, safety, Will Harris as well, who can play kind of all over the defense. So it's it. Those are probably the two biggest ones that could have some type of impact on the starting lineups. Outside of that, there's not a lot going on that impacts the starting lineup. I mean, the one that's going to get the most coverage is going to be the QB2 battle, but who really cares about a QB2 battle more than anything else? If your starting quarterback is going to be out on the field, that's all that really matters. But I think a lot of people are going to be talking a ton about Spencer Rattler versus Jake Hayner, who are the two young quarterbacks rookie and third or rookie and second year uh, quarterbacks that are going to be battling for that QB two spot. But uh, outside of that, I, I think that this roster is pretty constructed in terms of its top 22. I think the rest of the conversation is going to be what's the placement from 23 down to, well, I guess I should say 24 down to 53 because Taysom Hill has to factor in there somewhere as well as that extra guy. And then uh, what's going to happen with special teams, competition, rotation, and stuff like that. Ross, we care about the backup quarterback here in Atlanta. Just hey, uh, I mean, look, if, if, <laughs> we if, care about if, that. If I, if I was in a city that draft that paid a ton of money for a veteran quarterback and then immediately drafted one top 10, I'd care too because, I mean, that guy clearly, <laughs> clearly has some value for that team. So, yeah, I don't blame you. But when it's a fifth-round guy battling against a fourth-round guy from the year before, it doesn't need as much coverage as it's going to get. For sure, for sure. I just um, – I got one real quick for you. So – I've admired Cameron Jordan as much as I mm -hmm. don't like him. I admire what he does on the field. Like, we understand where he is in his career, right? It's coming towards the end. Is there anyone on that defensive line that you can say, hey, this guy can potentially step in and be that productive defensive edge type guy or going forward once Cameron Jordan start, decides to retire? Yeah, great point. I think I think a lot of people would gravitate towards Chase Young in this conversation. But for me, uh, it's Carl Granderson who lines up on the outside of him or has been lining up on the opposite side rather of Cam Jordan. Uh, he's on the brink of elite edge defender play. Now, when I say edge defender, I mean, not just as a pass rusher, but also he's been the team's best run defender on the defensive line for the past two seasons now eight and a half sacks last year 14 tackles for a loss last year also got his hand up for a batted pass 20 hits on the quarterback last season he's done a lot um, and so I think he could be a double double guy next year in terms of tackles for a loss and sacks I think he's the one that the team is looking at to most immediately take that step to being the next New Orleans Saints elite edge defender uh, and then from that maybe the rotation of being able to have guys like Carl Granderson and Chase Young take a little bit of the pressure off of Cam Jordan might be able to maximize the efficiency of Cam Jordan when he's on the field as well, I think is a little bit of the, the thinking there. Uh, but I would say that Carl Granderson is probably the guy that's next in line to be the next big uh, edge defender name here in New Orleans. Well, Ross, we know the Saints are looking to maybe build on what they were doing at the end of last season, maybe look to contend in the NFC South. We know the Falcons have made a lot of additions and adjustments so that they can contend for the title for NFC South as well. The battle, the showdown comes on September 29th, week four, where the Falcons host the Saints and then the Saints return the favor in week 10, November 10th. I'll be there, Ross. So hopefully I'll yes. get that. I'll be there here. too. Let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> You're coming to New Orleans? We're making plans. We're making plans. I love it. Take over, team. We're going down. I love it. You know, take over, baby. You got to be there. Sorry, are you going to be there? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to give y'all one piece of advice. 
I'm going to give you all one piece of advice. Don't take to Bourbon Street and start bringing out all the Falcon jerseys and everything. It never oh, works yeah. out for the teams that travel and do that. All right. Never. Just we're show not, up, nice. have a good time and enjoy the game. That's it. Yeah. Don't show That's out. It. It's not going to work out. Yeah. <laughs> Just come early Friday night or Saturday morning because you guys got to come to my tailgate on Saturday afternoon. There you go. You know, Louisiana is open carry. All right. Anyway, Ross, we appreciate your time. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Always a pleasure, y'all. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, hey, man. we talk about the Falcons. We talk about the Saints always trying to one-up each other, right? We'll tell you one thing where the Falcons actually may have done better than the Saints and what's next. This episode of our Atlanta Football Party is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. You heard it. We were just talking to our Locked On Saints host, Ross Jackson. They're passionate about what they do in New Orleans. The Falcons are passionate about what they do here in Atlanta. They both have the drive to win the NFC South, but they're both probably running out of patience to get there. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive with eBay Motors. eBay Motors does everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and so much more. So whether you're into speed, Power or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, it's about burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need and prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Locked On Sports Today is a free 24-7 sports streaming channel and is programmed to bring you the biggest sports daily without all the noise. Locked On Sports Today also brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news. Streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. ESPN recently ranked its 2024 NFL rosters based on the best projected starting lineups. Top 10, no surprise, 49ers, Chiefs, Ravens, Jets, Lions, Cowboys, Bengals, Texans, Bills, and the Eagles rounded it out. Then the criteria that ESPN used included biggest strength, biggest weakness, X factor, and non-starter to know. Now, the good news is the Falcons landed ahead of the Saints by one slot. Now, in your opinion, let's talk about that top 10 first. Is that pretty accurate for you going from the 49ers to the Eagles? And then is that an accurate rating for the Falcons at number 19, given the strength of this team and where they are right now? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the second part about the Falcons. I mean, what have they shown us with this new look, you know, to, to warrant being anywhere close beyond, like anywhere in the top half? You know, we have no idea what either offensive scheme is really going to truly look like. Kirk Cousins is coming off of an Achilles injury. Like, the, the, there are so many unknowns about this team that I I think that 19th is is pretty – or 18th is is pretty fair. You know, yes. that I, I think that's a pretty fair assessment of where the Falcons could be. I think, obviously – you hope that the production on the field warrants higher looks in the season. If they were to redo this ranking, you know, halfway through the season, you hope that the Falcons move up pretty significantly, fairly quickly. Um, yeah. But for right now, that that's what it is. Now for the the top ten, I I mean, it's the same thing. Like everything's about projections right now. No one yeah. actually really knows. And those are the teams. Those that top ten teams are the ones that have shown in the last year that they're playoff caliber teams. Um, yeah. to to a certain extent, um, give or take maybe a couple. But I, I think that, honestly, it's pretty fair. You know, you I think that you can throw out any number of, you know, rankings at this point in time in the offseason, and people are going to be like, ooh, like really looking into it. But to me, it's like it doesn't matter until you show show what you're doing on the field, and, and then you go from there. I agree. Yeah. You look at the 49ers, you expect them to be there. You expect the right. Chiefs and Ravens to be there. Now, the Jets, to me, they're they're banking that on Aaron Rodgers, A, playing and B, playing at an Aaron Rodgers level. I know. That's why I said, like, there's a couple in there that, okay, yep. those are a little bit of a, a, a little, little bias there. Yeah, just right, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Indeed. 
Definitely, I would agree as well. And then I think the Cowboys, that's a toss-up too because, well, we talked about Dak Prescott before and you kind of don't know how sometimes that can kind of linger into the season, some of that disconnect. And then the Bengals, same thing. You don't know what Joe Burrow is going to be. Now, if he's Joe Burrow, yeah, they, they deserve to be in that conversation. And then, of course, it's the Texans, the Bills, and they're obviously believing that the Eagles are going to look like the Super Bowl Eagles versus the Eagles that we saw last year. But Jarvis, when you look at that list, how, what did you think about that list? But also to Tori's point, when you look at where the Falcons landed at number 18 with their biggest strength being the O-line, biggest weakness being an edge rusher, X-Factor being Darnell Mooney and Kyle Pitts, non-starter being Charlie Werner, do you think that they fell in the right place? Um, I would say I want to start from the um, from the end, right? They hold Charlie Warren piece. <laughs> yeah. Can I throw Tyler uh, Tyler Algier in there? Like, can we can we talk about him? Can we understand what this man did in his rookie year? That he broke William Andrews' rookie rushing record. Like, can we talk about that for a second? Like, the man yeah. is a good running back, so I feel like he'll be the guy that'll be very effective. He's gonna have an impact in some way. If Zach Robinson, yeah, here's here's how. I can, on the, here's how I'll say in year one how Zach Robinson can be, be successful. If you can find a way for people to understand what Tyler Algier brings to the table from a production standpoint, that man is about to be a head coach pretty soon because you have so many different moving parts, right, that haven't really been proven. So I understand why they're 19. You talk about Drake London. I know what Drake London can potentially bring to the, bring to the table. But, you know, hey – you got to have somebody deliver the football like we talked about with Kirk Cousins earlier on. But Kyle Pitts, he had some good, some decent production in his rookie year with, with Matt in 21. So we understand we've seen that, right? But he hasn't done it in the past couple of years, and he's coming off an injury. He was still slowed by injury last year, even though he was on the field, right? Or, or was eligible enough to be out on the field or healthy enough to be out on the field. So I feel like it's just too many question marks for them to be anywhere near the top 15, like Tori mentioned. So, but, but yeah, I'm really interested to see what Zach Brink does with, with Tyler, because I feel like he can be a, a big X factor for his team, um, especially specifically inside the 20. Yeah. And free, I might say even the run game may be the X factor because so much energy and so much attention has been paid to what will Kirk Cousins do? What can he do? Will Michael Penix Jr. actually get an opportunity to start or play this season? And we, you're right, Jarvis, we talked about, about Bijan, of course, ad nauseum, and it's good to bring Tyler Algier back in the conversation because of what he was able to do. But you all know, I also said that I was intrigued and my X factor in some way might be Avery Williams because I'm interested to see what he'll be able to do when he comes back from injury. Yeah, I think you nailed it, T. You know, as for the top 10, the Jets were the one team that sort of stood out to me that was like, okay, I, okay. Know, we'll see, we'll see. But <laughs> I think with the Falcons, I, I was a little surprised that they were ranked where they were ranked because I've just seen so many lists over the last couple of weeks. You know, this is the time in summer where we're cranking out these these lists of like who's got the best roster. And as Tori said, like, like this stuff doesn't really matter that much. It's just like, yeah. it's like, how it's do fun. you – use your roster is what determines your, your success not sort of you know this is not fantasy football right uh where it's just like just get the best players and, and you'll be fine but right. um you know i was surprised that the falcons were ranked as low because i've seen a lot of these lists where they're ranking different position groups and the falcons are generally high on that but i think the ranking is right based off of what tori and jarvis said like the falcons have to go out there and prove it before we can sort of put them you know close to the top closer to the top 10 and whatnot so that was a little surprising but i agree with you t like the run game i think is going to be the focus of the offense i know there's been a lot of talk about the upgrades that the falcons have made at the wide receiver core obviously at the quarterback position and in the improvements of the passing game are going to make this season and they will make improvements in that area but at the same time i, I still think the core of the offense the foundation of their offense is still going to be built around the run game uh in in a major way and i think you know where Bijan robinson and Tyler Algier are, are going. And I, I still think the Falcons, this, one of the strengths of the Falcons is probably more so than the offensive line, that backfield between those two guys, just having, you know, one of the deeper two headed monsters in the backfield is probably, I think probably the true strength of this Falcons team at this point in time with Bijan and Tyler Algier. So I, I agree with you. I think the run game is sort of flying under the radar as something that's going to be a big part of the Falcons offense this year. 
Indeed. Thanks for stopping by the Atlanta football party. Be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, we're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you on the Atlanta football party dogs edition tomorrow.